Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the Other Israel Film Festival. My name is Isaac Zablocki. I'm director of film programs at the Marlene Myers and JCC Manhattan and the director of the Other Israel Film Festival. We're very excited today to have here um, a very special presentation of um, Asher's Command. Um, the hope, hope most of you saw the play reading and um, now we'll give you special access to a conversation about this fascinating play. Um, we have here members of uh, the cast and of the production and um, I'll introduce them in one moment. First, I'll just tell you what's going on here for the rest of the day. And we have uh, many more programs coming up. So please join us throughout the day at 2 p.m. Um, the conversation for Golda and the Prophet, two films that we combined into one panel. Um, and then 4 p.m. Kings of Capitol Hill about um, APAC and its relationship with Israel. And uh, at 6 p.m. we have a conversation in Hebrew about some of our short films. This is something new that we were trying as far as bringing in an Israeli perspective specifically. Tomorrow, um, much more coming, um, a common goal at 5 p.m. and um, the film uh, conversation for the film Mayor at 7 p.m. All the films are available throughout the week at all times and the conversations are all available either at the set times or then on our Other Israel YouTube channel. Um, tomorrow at 2 p.m. also there is uh, an Arabic, Arabic class led by the uh, Abraham Fund initiatives. So please join us for that and for more programs. We're here till Thursday and the responses so far have been very strong. Um, I'm very excited about uh, today's play reading um, conversation. Um, and I saw a reading of this play um, uh, um, just before the pandemic and uh, we were excited to find the right place to include it. And we weren't sure what that would mean under our new circumstances and the, um, and the new format. So um, we're really proud of what was put together um, on this Zoom and we're excited to have here um, members of the cast and uh, the producer and director of this project. So I'll start with um, Navid Negaban, who has been uh, been been at our festivals um, through with other films, and um, we're excited to have him back with this project. And he is the director, star, and producer of this. Navid, thank you very much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for giving us a home, and um, I'm I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. We'll, we'll just introduce everyone and then jump into the conversation. Um, he's here with other members of the cast that you um, might recognize. We have, um, um, I'll start with, I'll go according to my screen, um, Nikki Bullis. Nikki, thank you so much for being Hi. here. Hi, thank you so much for, for having us. Um, Peter Romano. Peter, thank you for being here. Hey, it's a pleasure. Um, Lara Wolf. Hi, such a pleasure to be here and see you all. Erica Leischerter, did I get that right? Loescheider. Loescheider, thank you. Hi. Thank you for being here. And to moderate this conversation, we have um, our, our good friend, um, the Tony Award winning producer of um, most recently the band's visit, um, but uh, also once and many others, um, Oren Wolf. Oren, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Oren, I hand it over to you. Great, thank you. Um, I'm right, so sorry, may I say something? Yes. Oren, uh, I have to introduce one more person. Yes. George, George Lucas. George Lucas is uh, Marilyn Feld's husband. Uh, and George has been so kind and so supportive of us. And he has been, uh, every step of the way, he has been with me. So I'm very grateful. Thank you for being here, George. And I was just notified that another member of the cast has just joined, um, Lacey Mayer. Lacey, we'll, we'll unmute you so you can say hi and oh. be. <laughs> hi, thank you so much. Hello. Thank you. Oren, back to you. Um, thank you, uh, Navid, for introducing George. Uh, and I, I really want to thank you all um, so much. It's I, doing these play readings, whether it's in normal times um, or COVID times, are, are difficult. These things require sort of spontaneous investment and like real emotional uh, commitment and vulnerability uh, to, to bring empathy 
and to, and to sort of instill empathy into these characters over Zoom, I really do think it's a Herculean task. So I just want to congratulate you all for having done that remarkably um, and, I, and being so generous with 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 how you 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 perform this play together digitally, um, I just think that deserves real applause. So thank you for that. You. Uh, and I'll begin with you, Navid. And actually, your introduction uh, to George is is part of my question, which is I'd love to know a little bit about your history um, with this play. To take on a play, to produce it, to direct it, to star in it, it's such a huge commitment. Um, uh, and I certainly can relate to, to, to sticking with something for a very long period of time and feeling passionate about it. I'd love to, for you to tell us a little bit about your journey with, with, with Marilyn and with this play uh, and how we ended up here today. And then, it, and then I'd also like for you to talk to us a little bit about how this process had to shift um, during COVID. That's going to be a theme of some of the things I want to talk about today is embracing the moment we're in. So I'd love to know how your your process sort of evolved from the time that you found this play till today and then most specifically what happened from March until the time that you recorded this reading. But we'll unmute you first. Unless there we go. Uh, uh, yes, I'm so sorry. Hi, thank you so much. I'm still getting used to the Zoom. Um, <laughs> we all are. <laughs> uh, first of all, thank you all for being here. I'm very grateful. Um, back in 2004, uh, 2003, I was doing a play with John Savage and uh, one day John walked in and handed me a script and said, this is a play that you have to read. And when I read the play, I fell in love with it. I got in touch with Marilyn. Uh, she was, at the beginning, she was very hesitant uh, because the play has, uh, has been misunderstood previously and some of the words and some of the concept and the feeling of the play was changed. And uh, I, um, I had to go through a long process. I did, a, I did a recording of the reading and I sent it to her. Uh, and um, then George is here, um, Marilyn's husband. And uh, she, uh, she contacted me and she said, for the very first time, I hear my words coming out of the actor's mouth the way that I meant them. And um, you can have it. You can do whatever you want to do with it. Um, so we did the um, we did a one night performance of the play in uh, 2004 here in Los Angeles, and it became it got lots of attention. And um, uh, after that, uh, I I got busy. I had to go overseas. I was working overseas, and I came back, and we were going back and forth. I was trying to um, adapt this into a screenplay or at least a limited series. And um, nothing was working until, unfortunately, Marilyn passed. And um, then I had to track George down. And uh, George was kind enough to give me the, give me the rights for the play. And uh, we did a performance. We did a reading of it um, in March in New York. And Isaac was there. Isaac saw it. And then he invited us to come back. Um, I was going through the process to adapt this into the screenplay when COVID happened and Isaac asked us if we can do a reading. Um, and I asked my wonderful cast, which without them, I would have never been able to do this. Um, and we all joined together and we did this in two days, I think. Uh, we did one day, we did a rehearsal and then the second day we recorded and then we cut it, we edited, we do the sound effect. And this is what you see right now. Are any of our, so are all the actors um, newly found and newly assembled for this reading? How many, were any of them involved in any of the uh, other, before the, before this per, actual reading, were there any of these, was anyone in this cast involved with the play? Uh, the whole cast, they were, um, um, is the same cast that they did the uh, reading in March. Uh, the only person that was changed was, uh, uh, was Samir, which I played Samir. Um, okay. During March, I was shooting the TV show Legion here in Los Angeles. So I wasn't able to make it. A friend of mine, Giancarlo Ruiz, who is a fantastic um, actor and director, he jumped in. He came to New York and it was it was one of those funny situations because I had to direct everyone via FaceTime 
and Zoom. Yeah. And uh, I was I was on the set, they were on the stage, so we were going back and forth. And it, it was amazing. They did a fantastic job. Were you rehearsing? And I, I, I hope everyone bears with me. I just want to stay with this for a minute because I'm really interested in this subject. And perhaps some of these viewers are too, because directing for a Zoom reading is such a unique thing. I mean, this is something we're figuring out as we go. Were you rehearsing with everyone as a group? Were you doing one-on-one -on -one rehearsals? How, how did that work? No, everyone, um, I, um, I, my actors, they were, uh, I mean, the whole cast, they were fantastic. Uh, some of them, they were kind of, they were more prepared than I was. And um, we did a group rehearsal. And then we have Alba Lala Zarzade, who is an amazing actress. And she also came in as a stage manager. So she was there, she was cueing everything in. The only thing wow. that we did one-on-one uh, -on -one was all the narrations, which Laura Vogel Vogels did that with me one-on-one. -on -one. And then I put all the narrations in. So, um, Alva was queuing us in and out. Uh, some of the some of the takes we had to do um, two or three takes, and mm -hmm. um, and then I I had to cut everything together. Uh, the eye lines we were trying to get the eye lines right, but the time was very limited. I mean, if you had two or three more rehearsals, everything would have been. I I mean, I'm very happy with what we got. Yeah. No, I think it's immensely successful, and, and I found it very moving. Um, and and it is it is interesting to point out, though, that this wasn't necessarily, this was edited together, so this wasn't like just a single take where everyone was doing this in, in real time, but that you were doing this and performing these, and then and then what we saw was actually edited together, right? Uh, yes, we had Beautifully some... done. We had some inter... Uh, some, um, internet problems uh we uh we had dropped frames uh so we had to wait for the internet to pick up again and then do it of course. Isaac, Isaac wanted us to do it live but if you would have done live this reading would have been three and a half hours because we had to stop for the internet I, so I've sat through them I know <laughs> and 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 I found this very effective I actually I was really happy with how smooth this was and actually it Thank felt you. much more this felt to me more of what you would have wanted it to be had we been in person in terms of the pace and in terms of the sort of rhythm of the whole thing. It felt very much like it had its rhythm, um, which I know it's impossible to do that in Zoom, even by conversation, much less reading a play. No, this gave us the opportunity to, um, to be able to even, um, because the read was longer, even the delivery was longer. It gave me the opportunity as yeah. a director to be sitting there and snip it and tighten even the dialogue. Everything was uh, was squished together to be exactly what I wanted to be. Yeah, it really is the bridge between theater and, and film, right? That's what this is, right? You're able to do that as a director, which is which again was very effective. And we'll jump into some of the themes of this too in a moment. Um, but I do want to introduce the cast and and have each of you um, that's interested speak to what this experience is like as an actor to, to, to record a performance in this way, something that is clearly meant to be presented as a play, um, to be experienced live. Um, certainly uh, that's how it was written. Uh, but can, you, can each of you take a minute and talk to perhaps something that surprised you about doing it in this format and maybe something that frustrated you? And I, I, I don't wanna go in any specific order, but maybe, um, Maybe Isaac can help us. Maybe raise your hand and we'll, we'll call on you um, if you have uh, something to share, something about, something about this process that either surprised or frustrated you or both. Who's going to be brave? Oh, there Lacey. we go, Lacey. Yeah. Um, hi. Um, I just want to say that um, something that's very frustrating about working as an actor on Zoom is that you're not in person. You're not feeling the other actor's energy around you. But something that is so surprising is you are using, you know, audio really helps. And you can see an actor as well, but it's kind of more in how they're delivering um, their performance, um, you know, from what you're hearing. And also, I've been doing a lot of um, Zoom readings and none of them has have been as professional as working with Navid on this because he knew what he wanted yeah. and was so clear and specific. So, um, 
you know, even the rehearsals were kind of effortless and joyful because he knew exactly, you know, what was happening. So it made it really uh, easy. I think that's a, that's really, um, that's, I, that I, just in what you just said now, it actually just rang very true to me, which is there is this theater is all about intimacy. And one thing that this medium does provide you is you get your person's voices literally right in your eardrum. I mean, you almost feel the vibrations of somebody talking yeah. and that is incredibly intimate. So you're right. That's, I never thought about that. And that's beautiful. Um, the audio, the sort of uh, audible intimacy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Nikki? Sure. Um, we'll go in order. I'm sorry. My, in my order. Everyone's order is separate. <laughs> We're going to go in my order. I... Um, you guys can hear me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. No, I, I, I agree that it was like intimate, which I would found surprising. I, I didn't think you would be able to connect with people as well as I think we did uh, in a Zoom reading. Um, and then there were numerous frustrating things for me. Like I would be very into my monologue or something like that. And then after the fact, they were like, yeah, you cut out like three times or four times. And I was like, oh, my god okay so i have to so i had to do like my monologues uh, again and uh, i set myself up in the same exact way that i had the zoom reading and then one quality was way higher quality than than the other so there was a lot of technical things that i found very frustrating that um that theater sort of provides you the space of just pure connection it's right there in front of you that you don't get with zoom but I think for what we did, it was, it turned out very, I watched it all and I, th I think it turned out really smooth. Like you, you did a beautiful job with the editing and everything. It turned out really great. Right. And we know in live theater, there's never any technical problems. So we know that's only the first thing. <laughs> Right. Yeah. That was just a joke. Just a joke. We have tons of technical problems in live theater, but no, I think you're, I think that's, that's really well said, uh, Nikki. Um, Anyone else have a, can, can share their experiences, Peter? Yeah, um, for me, it was actually kind of freeing the way Navid was working. Um, it felt a lot more like television um, in terms of the rhythm of how we were working. And, you know, we were working, going a full pass through the piece, stopping and starting and being like, wait, let's go back, let's catch that moment again. And so you had other opportunities as an actor to connect and say, oh, you know what? I wasn't really listening in that moment. I can take that again, great. Um, and the, the audio intimacy, like you were saying, Oren, um, it just allows for that kind of subliminal connection that we have when we watch films and when we experience films that um, you're, you know, you, you said this before we even got on, but it is this third thing. It's not theater, it's not film or television. It, this medium is, is its own, its own special thing. Um, and I think we were able to find something really beautiful within, within that. I totally agree with you. It is, it's sort of exciting. It's like amidst all this sort of, the, all the negatives and all this sort of contracting of, of art and experiences that's happening during quarantine, there's this amazing new art form that's sort of happening right underneath our eyes or our, our noses and our ears. And we don't need to call it theater. We can call it something else. It doesn't have to be something that existed before. It can be something new. Um, Laura, I want to call on you. I saw your hand go up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, for me, it is a very similar experience to what has been said before. What I've noticed is we actors, we have to train ourselves in our focus and concentration. Now, suddenly, not having the opportunity to have someone right in front of you that makes the concentration and focus a default thing is, is a challenge, right? And I see that as an opportunity to, you know, like focus the eye lines, work, the, work those angles that you then have in TV, right? So that has been very interesting for me. And also just, you know, knowing that we're so used to seeing with our eyes and perceiving the world mostly through our eyes, now suddenly switching to our ears, they're as valid, right? So that's a good training. It's almost like, let's do all the scenes now blindfolded. Let's see what comes of it. Yeah. 
That's beautiful. No, that's so true. You're right. We rely on totally different senses during doing it this way. It really is. It's like, it's forcing us to hear and experience things differently. Uh, Eric, did you want to add something? Yeah, at the risk of- I don't want to put uh, you on the spot. I thought I saw your no, yeah, yeah. Um, I feel like I'll be repeating a lot of the things that the, of course, the, we're missing the energy exchange of being in person that, yeah. <clears throat> you know, makes theater so live. And I think why sometimes recorded theatrical events, you know, are just a, a, a shadow of what they, what they were in person. Um, but <clears throat> to the intimacy thing of the, of the audible, you know, we, we can, um, well, I, I can speak for myself. I certainly have gotten involved in conversations on a phone where I am as full of energy and as connected to the person on the other line. And, you know, uh, they're not there, you know? And so it's interesting to, to experience, again, this, this, this audible connection. And again, to the vision that Naveed had um, <clears throat> makes me hopeful in the way that this may, may continue to blossom into something that is more watchable, enjoyable. The, the technicalities are ironed out. Um, and Naveed seemed like he knew what was, what needed to be done and what was going on and uh, uh, the smoothness, the, uh, I don't know, the fluidity of everything. It's just, it, it, it made me less cynical about where things are going uh, in regards to this. So it's, it was a great, a great opportunity to work that way positively. Very, very well said. Um, and I agree. Um, you know, if theater, theater is always, in my opinion, is an exercise in empathy. Uh, you know, actors have to be filled with empathy to embody a character. Audiences have to pretend that what's happening in front of them is real in order to empathize. And, and it's, it's this ultimate, it's, it's sort of the most selfless thing we can do as artists, as technicians, as producers, as, as, as ticket buyers. Um, and in this new medium, we're all, audiences included, being asked to stretch our muscles and to go further, as you just said, Eric. And I think everyone's commenting on this in a different way. We're all being asked to rely on different senses and different experiences in order to tap into that root empathy, which I, I and I wanna shift that a little bit into the themes of what this play is, right? This idea of empathy, this idea of putting yourself in someone else's shoes, which I think all great theater and all great storytelling really in its essence, that's what it's about. Um, so seeing this, for, for the other Israel film um, uh, subscribers and, and people that are gonna watch this conversation and, and will take the time to watch this reading, we're sort of experiencing that in real time, how hard we have to work to empathize to hear someone else's experience. And I'll get to my question now. Uh, you know, this play, it's about very real events in, in the not too distant past. Um, and I'm curious to hear each of you uh, to take a moment to speak to in, in, in how, in, in your experience, how does live theater, live, so to speak, in this format, but how does the, the, this medium really allow an audience to understand these events in a new way? Uh, and specifically, does this work have the ability to push an audience further in their understanding of these events than let's say a documentary could? And if so, how? And, and I think if it's okay, uh, Naveed, I'd like to give you a chance to maybe answer that first. And I'd love to, to give the cast, a, and, and I'd like to hear everyone's point of view about that. Um, so if you can, and if I need to repeat the question, I'm happy to. Uh, no, thank you so much. Um, first of all, uh, about the reading on the stage and the Zoom, if I may add something. To me, I started, I started on the stage. Yes. I started in Germany. And uh, for me, uh, the stage has always been the sun. It warms you up. It you 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 it takes you in. And if you can find a magnifying glass, and if you find the point, if you are able to focus that sun into the lens, then you can burn. You can burn something. You can start a fire. And that's what what we have been trying to do through the Zoom or through the performances that it comes and it comes focus is you, you are, you are bringing the whole sun's energy into your lens. And if you can capture that, right, you can go very far. It becomes a laser beam. And Beautiful um, metaphor. thank you. And um, for me, um, 
I think now you have to repeat your question. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I'm not good at this. So I, I ask very long winded questions. I I'll have to remember, remember it myself. I, I think my, the, the, my question is, is in, in considering this medium, and I am asking you to think about this as both a I play that would be performed live or not. Can this push an audience to understand these events in a way that goes beyond what a documentary could? Yes, yes, it does. Um, the very first performance that we did, I did back in 2004, I'm, I'm a refugee. I lived in Germany. I was a, uh, I was a refugee living in a camp and, and that's how I started my journey. I left Iran when I was young during the war. I've traveled through the world and I met people and by meeting people, I got to know them. I got to understand them. I went in without, I went in and I tried to take them in and learn from them. Every person who crossed my path became a, became my teacher, became my mentor. Everybody had a gift to hand it to me. The first time that I did the play, I did it, um, I did it here in Los Angeles. What I did, I had some um, bizarre scents. I bought some scents and I placed scents under the seats. Some shavings, some dirt on the floor. The, the audience, they are walking in, they are walking on the dirt, they are walking, they are smelling the whole thing. They are smelling the city when they are walking in. And then I invited very, very specific guests. I invited a rabbi, then I invited an imam. I invited someone from Israel. I invited someone from Los Angeles. I invited someone from Palestine. I invited someone from Jordan and all of them high profile people. And what I did, I placed them next to each other. Mm -hmm. So they were coming in with a sign sitting and they had to sit next to each other. And I, I it was an amazing experience because I could see these people that are coming and they're sitting next to each other. And this is the look. <sighs> so that's how they started their, uh, their play. That was their judgment of the other person who's sitting next to them based on what they have heard and what they have seen in the news. Now they're sitting next to this person and they have to spend two hours watching the same thing. Or they started the play with an argument. The audience, they were arguing with me regarding the play. I said, it's just a point of view. Why don't you watch it? And then you tell me what you think. At the end, these people, especially, especially the moment that Samir meets Rivka, I'm watching these people and they have tears in their eyes and they are turning around and looking at each other with this. We all have kids. We all have brothers. We all have sisters. If we strip everything away, whatever is left at the end is that pure white light. That pure light, white light doesn't have a religion, doesn't have a gender, nationality. So I was able to capture that inside the theater, they were able to go back into their source and see each other as the source. And then I had to kick him out of the theater. I said, guys, please go across the street. There is a coffee shop. You go there, I will come over there and we spend the night talking. Marilyn, she was, uh, that woman, what she captured, she captured the essence of each of these individuals. And the play has been misunderstood many times. The people, they look at it. And I had people here that were telling me, we love the material. We would love to turn it into a TV show. But can you change the ending for the movie? Can you change the ending? Give it a little bit of hope. I said, what are you talking about? I'm not giving anybody hope. I just want to raise a question. You have to find the answer. From, for someone who is coming from a torn country that I've lost friends during war. And there were people who were sitting next to me in the classroom and the next day you see just a red tulip sitting in their seat. And you know that the person is not coming back for me has always been, why all of us, we have that breath inside us, the breath of God. How can we go and kill God in the name of God? And that has been my mission throughout my, 
my work and I hope that I was able to capture it. I love this play. This play is about loss of humanity. Yeah, well, it's so beautiful what you've just said and 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 you speak to obviously something as a I'm I only produce theater and I clearly I love it. And what you just spoke to, it's funny because that is actually it's the one thing that this virus keeps us from doing, right? Sitting next to a stranger in the mm -hmm. dark and watching a story live. That's the one thing that we don't have right now. Yeah. And it's the very essence of why these plays of what you put together in that day and that night and bringing everyone to that coffee shop. Um, that's beautifully said and very moving to hear you tell it. Thanks. Um, I'd love to give anyone else a chance to comment on this, to talk about in your views as actors and as people who I know have sat in theaters and watched plays before, how can this medium push these stories further? Peter. Um, yeah, I, that was beautifully said, Navid. Um, so the medium, again, getting back to this medium, it does provide something that Brecht was on about, you know, years and years ago, which is this alienation that can happen between the audience and the material. And so that they're aware that they're watching a story being told and suddenly start asking why characters take the actions they take, right? Not just what's gonna happen next, but why does it happen and why does it have to happen? Uh, and I think that's a part of the important question that Naveed, you just, you know, are, are trying to laser in on by putting this play out there and not answering the question, but asking the question with the material. Um, and I think, I, I think having that distance and having that alienation effect can maybe allow an audience to sit and watch it a little bit differently than if they're confronted face to face with it as they would be in a theater, you know, like the, that beautiful experience that Naveed described um, is like the other half of the same coin, right? And then the, there can be the intellectual side, maybe with distance. Yeah, I think that's right. Again, it's, it's, it's going back to what we talked about on this last question, which is we're all, for, all the, for, for everything that the live theater can do when we're in a room together, physically experiencing it, and we know how powerful that can be, we're all being asked to stretch ourselves right now in this art form, in this moment today, yeah. to, to experience this play as you guys have presented it. Um, and it really is, it's beautiful to watch it. Um, and... And I, and, I, and I can't wait, to, as an audience member, I can't wait to get the chance to sit in a live theater and sit next to a stranger and see this story be told. Because I really do think that asks us to go further um, with our imagination. It's also, this is the art form of what you don't see, right? Isn't that, isn't that also a difference between theater and film? It's the theater, we have to suggest so much in, on the stage because we can't just show everything. So maybe it's all those suggestions that also allow us to go further. Um, does anyone else want to comment on this as a medium? This is really about the theater itself. Um, yes, Nikki. Um, I, I, I think with documentary, it's you get sucked into the, the, the events. And I think with theater, you get sucked into the characters. And sometimes that can maybe make it more relatable because you're going, you're, you're, ta you're talking about people to people. Like I'm, I'm a person in a seat. I'm watching a person go through this, the struggle and I think sometimes documentaries while they can focus in on on people sometimes I think it can be a little bit more general as well and so people may not be able to connect as deeply and as personally to issues like this one which is it sometimes I think this issue is such a big one but it's also just a person to person we're, we're two sides of the same coin yeah which was my like my character is two sides of the Tarek and Ruben is two sides of the, of the same coin and we're person and a person so we just need to relate and I think theater allows you to see the person um the issue through the person not so much the events which I think is more documentary focused a lot of the times and that's why it's it, it can be mm -hmm. such a powerful medium when you're watching it uh, and, and and then the whole experience sitting next to strangers is another way to just sort of have a different layer on it as well. So it's it's a great medium. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, I was talking to another theater producer not not too long ago about 
when theater gets back in, when we're allowed back into a theater again, right? Whether it's a movie theater or a live theater, there is going to inherently be risk. Even if there's a vaccine, even if people are wearing masks and getting tested, there's gonna be a risk. Mm -hmm. And if you look at a lot of times in the history of the theater, when theater has evolved, there was a risk from an audience's standpoint, not just the writers and the artists, but even the audiences had to take risks to attend theater. And there is something brave and potentially beautiful that can happen when we come out of our, when we open our doors again and walk outside and go into a crowded theater uh, that involves in risk that's inherent. And that's certainly inherent to these characters in this story. Um, and, and actually, Nick, you know, you touch on some of the themes and that sort of gets to what my next question is. And I don't want to blow past anyone. So if we want to go back uh, after I ask this, we can, but you know, uh, Marilyn once wrote, she wrote, I want the play to say, as Asher does, is that all life needs to find a place between extremes. Um, it's a beautiful, simple statement and sentiment that, that really does feel central to what this, what, this, what this play is about. And I just wanted to ask you all to comment on, on this, which is you know, with shows like Fauda and Our Boys uh, and other plays that talk uh, about the Middle East and they're finding their way into the American mainstream. How do you all as artists, how do you feel about our our ability in this country to grapple with these complicated issues that Asher's Command spotlights. And do you feel even as our country is becoming more fractured and more conflicted than any time in recent history, that we as Americans have the ability to understand nuance and to see both sides? Yeah, Laura? Um, I believe I believe we have an opportunity here. I oftentimes think the roles that allow to report um, historical events, we as artists are almost journalists. We're not giving our opinion, right? We are portraying on, on an art level through emotion, hopefully gapping this bridge and making people feel and ask let them ask their own questions, right? So I, I look at it almost that, because at some point in my life, I wanted to be a journalist. And if I have the opportunity to, um, to be involved in projects that talk about what's happening in the world, especially in the Middle East, um, I, I think that's a beautiful thing. And, and it's very important to do that um, exactly because of that. So it's not my job to, give my opinion, you know, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm a server to this and the people can make their own opinion. And that's important to me. It's just raising awareness, right? That's beautifully said. It also speaks to the sort of selflessness that it takes to be an actor, to, to really be able to empathize and to put, put something else in front of you um, and be a vessel that other people can watch and react to. I'm curious to know, Navid, go ahead. Um, uh, one of the things yeah. that we know is that we have, a, um, in America, especially the, our industry, we have such a huge impact. I, um, I, I was a little kid, I grew up on wild, wild west, and um, I always wanted to be a cowboy. I even have pictures. I have pictures that I, I will show you guys. I have pictures that I dressed as a cowboy as a little kid. Um, when I came here, I when I became more familiar with the history, with what has happened and all those things, I kind of changed my mind. I wanted to be the Indian. I wanted to be the chief. And to me, is that we need to act, we need to be very cautious what we are putting out there. And because people are tuning in to what we hand them, and that is what is forming their opinion of someone else. As a creator, we, we cannot feed on other people's fears. It's okay, I love horror films. But I, I don't want to make someone look, I, I just, it, 
lots of problems. We are, we are, one of the movies that it really got my attention was Wag the Dog. Have you seen that movie? Yeah. Mm-hmm. This is exactly what we are doing. And down the road, what I was doing, I did, uh, I played the Shah of Iran in a film that I did. I met with someone who was Robert De Niro's character. And this person came and he was giving me information about the history, what has happened for me to be, to get in touch with the inner thoughts of the Shah of Iran. We need to be very careful what we are putting out there. We need to be, we need to act very, very responsibly. And unfortunately, um, we have forgotten why we became an artist. Now everybody is becoming greedy who is paying me more money, it doesn't matter. I will sell my soul just because I want to get the fame, I want to get the money. But we can change the world. We can make the world a better place if we stay truthful to the core and speak the truth. Uh, That's my opinion. It takes courage. I mean, it takes courage for you, Navid, to stick with us and to continue to push this play and to put this in front of audiences. And it takes courage for all of you as actors to be going through what I imagine, even with TV happening and film happening to some extent, this is an incredibly difficult time for people all over the world, granted, but but certainly for actors too, who are uh, especially rooted in theater, um, who have been robbed of that opportunity for a year. Uh, it takes courage to put yourself out there and to do this kind of work. Um, we need to be responsible. Let me show you this. Um, do you guys see this? <laughs> <laughs> You're a cowboy. So this, is, <laughs> this was the cowboy. But we need to, we need to also look, look into the Indians because the Native Americans, sometimes we forget them and we cannot do that as an artist. Well, they're talking about land and talking about um, the politics that are involved with people moving through land. It's, it's, it's central to every, every uh, conflict we have in this world. Um, well, let me, let me ask sort of one final question here before we, we can, if, if there are questions from the, from the audience, we can take that. But, um, but Naveed, we all hope and, and, and expect for this play to, to have a, a life um, as it moves forward. Um, and I would love to know, or I'd love for you each in your own words to talk, um, if you were in speaking to other, uh, Israel film, other Israel Film Festival audiences, how would you have them explain to their friends if they were to watch this and then they were gonna go tell their friend, how would you ask, how would you hope that they would explain what this is about? to a friend. And it's an important question because I'm a producer. So I'm always wondering if, how do, how is someone, it's, we call it the elevator pitch, right? The door's closing. Someone says, what's that play about? What do you, how would you hope an audience member would ask that, would answer that question? To me, it's about lust of humanity, uh, blind love. It's about an Arab man who becomes a surrogate father to this young Jewish boy how their love gets destroyed through the conflict. And I just hope that that the people watch it and put themselves in their shoes. What would you do? How would you respond to it? Mm -hmm. It's about the questions. Yeah. That's about the questions. Ask yourself a question. Don't don't look for an answer. I cannot give you an answer. I, uh, I don't want to take too much time. I, I'd rather let others uh, to speak, but I have traveled around the world. I work in the places that I had to have a security guard one step away from me all the time. And I told the guy, I said, you are, you are causing, causing more danger for me by just by you standing there next to me with a gun on your belt and with the suit, just walk away from me. Let me be. And those people, they took me in. They, I have gifts from those people who people told me you have to be afraid of them. 
I went to Hebron. I was, I've been going back and forth to Israel. I went to the old city. I wanted to cross and go to the old part. And my security guard was telling me, you cannot go, you cannot go, you cannot go. I said, what are you talking about? I just want to go and see it. And I handed him my backpack. I took my passport and I just walked in. The moment that I walked in, I could see that the people are looking at me. Who is he? What is he doing here with his camera? And who is he? By the time that I got to the end of the bazaar, everybody was surrounding, uh, surrounding me. And an old man came, a, a son came, took me to his father's shop, making fr hats from the lambskin. And he handed me a hat and I said, I don't want it. He said, no, this is a gift. I put it in, I put it on. And then he said that my father says, just please take pictures, tell my story show us and i have those pictures when i brought it out with the organization peace now i i showed them the pictures and they told me never we have never been there we were never allowed to go there to see what's happening there so how can you how can you make a difference if you don't know what's happening on the other side and to me it's just come together see each other Gosh, it's beautiful, Naveed, because even central to that story, it's about physically being somewhere, right? It's like going back to what we talked about in the theater, physically being mm -hmm. next to a stranger. It's just yeah. something about that that's so central to this play and so central to this medium. And, and to film, too, for Isaac and all of the people at the film festival, it's different to watch a play on Netflix or a film on Netflix as opposed to sitting at the JCC and watching it next to strangers. Anybody else want to comment on that and comment on what, what you feel this play is about in as few and as in, as in as distilled a manner as possible? If I, well, if I had to, yeah. if I had to really um, condense this, I would probably say this is about a, a friendship that is as pure as it can get, that is conflicting with the external um, circumstances, because really that's that's what it that's what it is. The friendship is pure, right? If you look at, if you just look at the friendship, it's that white light that Navid was explaining earlier, right? But then you have it's like an onion. You have all these layers and layers and layers, and people put importance onto it until you have to believe it too, because you're forced to do it, because you belong to a certain group. And the belonging to a certain group is always dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, I, Laura, if, to jump off of that, um, I think it's about um, uh, Asher deciding between humanity versus nationality and mm. the intersection of those two things and wh where they don't meet and the incongruency of how that doesn't make sense, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Those two things being in conflict. Yeah. Well, I, I, I so appreciate this, guys. Um, I, this is one of these plays, and, and clearly you are all artists, um, where we all, I certainly feel like I could sit here and talk to you all day about this uh, and about the, the world at large, because we all have so many questions about this play and, and everything else going on around us. Um, but I want to thank you all so much for, for doing this and for being here. And thank you, Naveed, for taking the time. And George, for you, for giving for Naveed the, the, the freedom to, to pursue this. Um, we're all very grateful for that. Um, and I'll turn it back over to you, Isaac. Thank you. And I know George wanted to say something. George. Yeah, just very briefly. Uh, Mary oh. herself characterized the play as a Greek tragedy. She was a student of Greek tragedy. And you had a beautiful, beautiful relationship, which was destroyed by these unfeeling external circumstances, which is the essence of Greek tragedy. Also, by the way, she also visited the West Bank when her Israeli hosts were absolutely horrified and sure that she was put, put herself into extreme danger. Thank you, George, and thank you for being here. Courage. 
Um, I've, I've been seeing some uh, wonderful comments and responses in the chats. Um, I don't think it was as much the questions, but more, more just people really um, engaging in the themes of the play in different ways and from different perspectives. Um, we're short for time, but I wanted to ask one last question um, kind of to everybody and Aaron, that includes you. Um, under, under our COVID circumstances, I would love to hear what you all are working on, how it's impacted you, and uh, what you're working on next. Um, Naveed, can we start with you? Um, well, at the moment, I'm building the center, the Romani um, Center, which is, a, um, which is an artist foundation in Boyle Heights. Um, I can house up to eight artists, and so I give them studio space, workspace. They can work, they can live, and create. And this is something that I've been working on since since uh, beginning of the year. We are building, we are doing the construction on it right now. And actually, the part of my part was recorded in the studio. And um, I'm also looking at some other materials. There are a couple more plays that I'm hoping to do. Zoom readings like that, record them, put them together, and um, just staying creative. Thank you, Laura. Um, for me, it's really been a time where I've been able to focus on being creative myself. So I've been writing a lot. Uh, I'm part of a theater company called Primitive Grace. We write our own um, scenes and we have other actors present them. And that has been wonderful because it's great as an actor to step on the other side and be a writer and the, and the director. I've also been painting a lot. I have a little gallery around me, you can't see. <laughs> um, and I've been working on music. So I've been just like trying to expand wow. in my little room. That's what I've been doing. <laughs> Thank you, Nikki. Uh, yeah, that question is like the kiss of death for me because I, I, I'm trying to stay as creative as possible. But um, yeah, there's I'm writing. You know, I don't see a lot of um, Arabs in the in uh, like powerful good positions. They're always in bad positions and in negative light. So I'm trying to write a like Arab superhero um, origin story. And I want to make it a, a, a comic book out of it, find an illustrator to make a comic book out of it and sort of just try to um, create this little comic of, of an Arab superhero just to have some sort of a little Arab boy who's like, I can be a good a force of good, you know, in the world, because I don't think the media really always shows that. And like Navi was saying, it's like we have a uh, we have power in how we present and how people perceive. And that's sort of what I want to work on. So that's what I've been doing. Great. Lacey. Um, well, I'm very inspired uh, by what Naveed said. I think it's true that it's important as a storyteller, um, you have a great responsibility uh, in the world to add to the world conversation and not take, not take away. Um, and I have a TV series that I finally have all of my materials together and I'm getting ready to pitch. So um, wow. fingers crossed, I'm very excited. I'm on the very, I just connected with the producers. So we're getting ready to head it out into the big network world. Hopefully we get one, so. I hope you have a role for all of us in it. Uh, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Peter. Yeah, so um, uh, one of the things I do to support myself as an artist is teach, and my wife does as well. And when the pandemic hit, we saw the importance and we saw the need for theater arts in the schools, um, especially over this virtual medium. So we started a company with two friends where we're bringing theater into schools for free. We, we charge the schools nothing. We provide them with theater arts workshops. We've reached uh, four or five schools, high schools and middle schools so far. And um, we've put on two Zoom readings, uh, whatever we want to call them, <laughs> uh, with uh, Shakespeare. We're engaging them with Macbeth and wow. um, a contemporary play as well. Um, and we're, you know, trying to take this to the next level. And I think the ultimate goal was if we were in person, you know, bringing these shows into their school and showing them that you don't need a set or lights or budgets or anything and 
we've dubbed ourselves the apocalyptic artist ensemble for now because we're forming theater around a campfire as it were around the MacBook. <laughs> so um, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Eric. Uh, yeah, I've been doing a lot of gardening. So trying to work with my hands more, <laughs> tending to things that I haven't been able to really do in more of a, my city life as I'm, I'm remote a little bit right now. So it's been really rewarding that way to literally be experimenting with something physically creative in front of me. Um, been trying to write uh, and I have also been exploring a project with Euripides the Bacchae um, with uh, picking up with something that I had put aside some months before the pandemic had happened. And now it's time to, to pick that up again in terms of looking at some of the themes uh, of that in terms of group think and hysteria. Um, and so uh, there's been a lot of that lately. So I think that, you know, might be the time to pick this up again. Well, finally, Oren, <laughs> what have you been working on? How's the pandemic been treating you? I, I, yeah, it's been thrilling. Great, great for theater. Great day. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I run a big touring company, so we've got, I mean, we're planning on about 14 national tours starting in the fall of 21. So we're, we have a big, big goals to get back out there and get theater turned back on nationally in a very big way, including the band's visit. I'll go back out on tour. And then, um, but the development side has been great. Um, I'm a producer, so it's, you guys are all doing things that are much more tactile, but uh, I'm developing um a new musical that's based on uh, Afro-Cuban music, the Buena Vista Social Club, which was an album that was made in the late nineties that we're working with a group of Afro-Cuban artists to bring to the stage. Fun, fun. Hopefully we will all be back um, in person very soon. Um, till then folks, first of all, I wanna thank our amazing panel, um, Navid and all of the, the cast for being here. Thank you so much. I want to thank uh, the amazing Oren Wolf for his um, insightful questions and for um, bringing it all together and tying it in um, so beautifully. Thank you so much. Um, and of course, tell your friends, um, these films and this piece are available all week and uh, till Thursday night and much more, of course, from the other Israel Film Festival. So um, please join us for more and we look forward to seeing you and stay safe, everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us, truly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you all. Bye, guys. Jan, please, we stay in touch. We talk. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>